Well, 6 a.m., shall we begin? And we Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for a place to meet. Uh, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. Teach us your word. Um, help us, Lord, not just to keep it inside, but to share it. And to warn all that you are coming again. And you're coming again soon. We don't know when. But we do know that you are coming. And help us to share truth and point out in love error, Lord, that you might be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll just mention one thing. Yesterday, I sent out an email. My wife says, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, well, we've already got it on our fire stick, but there's a new, uh, relatively new TV channel. It's free. It's called Redeem TV. If you have a fire stick or a smart TV, you can get the app. Do you have it? We watched a movie last night. We'd mm -hmm. already seen it, but what did you watch? Angie's Choice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's one up there that I'd like to watch on Peter. Uh, that I just got an email yesterday. It's about the life of Peter. And that, uh, Bruce Marciano, who plays Jesus in several movies, he's pretty good. Um, he, he's in it as Jesus and talking about the life of Peter, basically, an hour and 20 minutes long. But anyway, there's new Christian, pro there's Christian programming they have for kids. Um, Pilgrim's Progress, you can watch there. And then you watched it yesterday. Did you? Okay. Um, and there's other movies up there too. So I'm just, whole Bible series for kids. Mm -hmm. So it might be something that's in school. Matches. I don't know. But um, just, you're all aware it's free. Free is good. I can afford free. You can watch it on your phone, on your tablet, or on your smart TV. So if you have a Fire Stick, you download the app. It's free. So free, free is always good. I should turn it off. I'll write it anyway. So, um, it, but we're going to see if today's interesting. It's not less than half an hour for both of them, and we'll, we'll uh, watch them today and then we'll finish up. Okay. If you reject the doctrine of uh, penal substitution, can you still be a Christian? Um, I would say this, if you don't fully understand the doctrine of penal substitution, but you at least understand that Christ died and paid the penalty for your sins and you accept him as your savior, you can be a Christian. You might not be able to articulate the full doctrine, but to deny that doctrine, to, to say that Christ did not die in your place for your sins is to flatly deny the atonement itself. And it is to deny the, the validation of the Father who raised him from the dead. He was raised for our justification because the penalty satisfied the justice of God. You see, the resurrection was the affirmation that Jesus was who he said he was and that what he did worked. The devil has no claim on him. Sin has no claim on him. Death has no claim on him. Therefore, the good news for the Christian is that when we belong to Christ, all of those things can be said of us as well. Then in the end, I stopped believing that Jesus physically rose from the dead. You know, you end up sort of believing it's a metaphor. You know, like, and all the way through this, as I would talk to people, they'd go like, you're trying to mess with my faith. And I was like, no, no I'm just trying to hold on to mine. I'm just trying to stay in the game. There's no metaphor here. Christianity wouldn't exist had it been a metaphor. If the resurrection of Jesus wasn't a real event in real history, then Christianity is false and the questions mean nothing. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain and you're still in your sins. You can't deny Christ and you can't deny his work and be saved. There came a point five or six years ago where I had a bike crash and I almost died. And, and, and I, I had a head injury and for a month I couldn't think straight. And when I came out of that, when I, when I, when I recovered my senses, I realized like, I'm going to die. I almost died and I'm going to die. And when I die, this brain of mine will break down and my personality is right here in my brain. I know that because like if you smash my brain against a tree at 40 miles an hour, I change. And I remember saying to my wife, I think this life is all we get. And she said, yeah, I think so too. And she said, I think you better stop being a professional Christian because you don't believe any of it anymore. So I'm a secular humanist because I don't believe in supernaturalism, 
but I'm really committed to these values of love and justice and wonder and gratitude. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. There's a myth in our culture that Christianity in the West is dying. But if you look closely at the denominations that are hemorrhaging members, it's all the same denominations who have stopped teaching fundamental Christian truths, like the inerrancy of scripture, uh, like the exclusivity of Jesus and salvation, and the reality of hell. They've given up on teaching these Christian truths, and in the process, they have been emptied of the power that is the gospel. Stained with blood, so divine, a wondrous, I tried the gospel. I loved the idea of a loving Jesus, and I kept changing, I kept ignoring Bible verses and underlining different Bible verses, and I kept like bending things around so that I could end up with a God who I could truly love. The problem is, is that once you're done making all those adjustments, I realized that the God I believed in was a God of my own invention. Believe me, the last God I believed in was awesome. I loved that guy. He was just like me. So what we're seeing is not the failing of Christianity in the West. What we're seeing is nominal Christians who were never Christian to begin with are shedding that skin, they're setting aside that garb, and they're, they're being honest about who they really are. If my whole life and my whole identity and all my relationships depend upon me believing in Jesus in a certain way, I'd be crazy to entertain any other idea. And exchange it one day. The wonder isn't that I stayed a Christian for 30 years. It's that I got out at all. The only difference between me and the atheist is the grace of God. And so I was driving in my car one day and was listening to the radio, just kind of scanning, and I heard this man's voice actually answering a lot of the claims that this pastor had brought up in class. He was just very calm and intelligent in how he was answering these claims. And it turns out that it was a Christian apologetics event. And the man answering the questions was Ravi Zacharias. And so I discovered this whole wide world of apologetics. So I began to follow him and got hooked up with a seminary and began to take classes in seminary. I began to study and study and study. And I'm so thankful to God that what was reconstructed through the help of the Holy Spirit was historic Christianity that looks a little bit different than what I was raised with. There have been some things I've corrected along the way. There have been some doctrines I've rethought, but the core, the gospel, stands. And the historic claims that Christianity has made for 2,000 years stands. The Bible is reliable. And I've, I've come to affirm in an even stronger way than before that it is authoritative for my life, that it is, as Jesus said it was, the Word of God. Liberal Christianity shares a foundation with atheism, with unbelief. I think atheism is actually the most healthy spiritual response to that view of God. That's why you can have an atheist like Richard Dawkins who shares the same moral indignation and disgust over a doctrine like penal substitutionary atonement as the liberal theologian. Why didn't he just forgive them? Why was it necessary to have a human sacrifice, to have his son tortured and executed in order that the sins of mankind should be absolved? Is that not the most disgusting <laughs> idea you ever heard? And the question is, do I know people whose belief in the supernatural has died the same way mine did, who are still preaching in pulpits, and who are still working as missionaries. I do, I know lots of them. They write to me secretly, and they say the same thing to me. They say, listen, at this stage in the game, what else am I gonna do? 
Who else? Where am I going to go? What is there for me outside of this? These are essentials to the gospel. This is what Christianity is. And if we deny those things, it might be something else, but it's not Christianity. Probably the biggest single heresy of fundamentalism is that it turned around the biblical notion of faith 180 degrees. Faith clearly means, the very word means, walking in darkness, not certitude. He's actually saying maybe that faith is blind, which of course Christians don't understand faith to be a blind leap in the dark. And we also don't understand it to be 100% certitude, which is what Richard Rohr is pitting faith against. He's basically saying the opposite of faith is complete and 100% absolute certainty. Neither one of those are biblical definitions of faith. Faith, biblically, is trust. And often throughout Scripture, we see that trust being based on good evidence to believe that something is true. This is why we refer to the Christian faith as being a reasonable faith. And so for me, I, I, I sometimes look at, at Tony and Rob Bell and all my kind of progressive Christian friends, and I think to myself, there's so many people trying to reform the church, and there are so few people trying to create loving communities for people who don't believe in any of the stuff. I wish some of you would just give up the language and come over and help me. I'd rather them be honest about their unbelief than staying within the church and corrupting it from within. It's actually a purifying effect on the church, and it's a good thing. When I do evangelism, and you say, evangelism? I think evangelism like technically means sharing the good news. It's just that my good news is that you can pursue goodness for its own sake. I mean, it's funny, like, Jesus at one point said, you know, if you really want to understand the gospel, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And then he said, and the second commandment is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love people. And the great irony is that this is actually a summary of the law. And so on some level, Jesus was saying like, look, you want to know the ultimate expression of Christianity? Love people. And I go like, I don't think he was far off. And so, you know, people say like, wow, you haven't really changed that much since you left Christianity behind. And I go like, no, I haven't. Essentially what you're saying is our goal is to actually keep the law. And that's something that the gospel is here to remind us that we cannot do. And that's not good news. That's why the gospel is good news to those who recognize that they're sinners, to those who recognize that they, there is a flaw deep in humanity that isn't going to be fixed by doing all the good works that you can think of in the world. Both in the prosperity gospel and in the emergent movement, the message still is about you and what you do either to achieve a better you or to achieve a better world. It's all about law. It's all about what you can do. Instead of about God and, and what He has accomplished in history for us and for our salvation. No, the good news is that He saves me from trying to make myself a better me when I can't. And He saves me from the guilt and bondage of a world that is full of oppression and injustice. In your humanist worldview, how, does, how do all the sins of the world get reconciled and fixed? They don't. They don't. That's why you have to try to stop people from hurting people. That's why you have to work to make a better world. Because there's some brokenness you can't fix. There are some wounds you can't heal. There are some losses you can't make right. You can't make whole. In response to that gospel, I do want to love and serve my neighbor. But it's not because that's the gospel. Yes, we should do good works. That should be a fruit of our salvation. But that isn't what saves us. It can't save us. God is jealous for His own glory, and He will not share it with anybody else. Contemporary worship so often begins with man and his need rather than God and His glory, that we've essentially placed ourselves at the center of the universe. See, the cross to me isn't the revelation of my sin. The cross is actually the revealing of my value. 
we put man in the middle of it. Man is this great prize and this great reason. Something underneath of that sin must have been of great value for heaven to go bankrupt to get me back. Mm. As though the world just existed, God happened upon us and he saw man and was just so taken with us that he decided to do something about it. If the blood of Jesus determines your worth and heaven went bankrupt to get you back, that makes you pretty worth it. People say the cross is a sign of how much man is worth. That's not true. The cross is a sign of how depraved we really are. That it took the death of God's own son. So there's a song called Worth. It was written by the associate pastor of my former church. And part of the lyrics go, you thought I was worth saving. You thought I was worth saving. You thought I was to die for. You thought I was to die for. When you really think about the lyrics of that song, it's suggesting that we were owed something by God. When we flip this, and when it becomes man-centered, and, and when there becomes this inherent worth in me that drew out this work of Christ. Heaven went bankrupt to get you back because God thought that you were worth the price that he paid to redeem you. All of a sudden, the idea of grace is gone because it is merited. I did Jesus a favor by being so wonderful instead of Christ and his finished work being an act of God's grace to me. Now this is very, very important. God's motive for saving people is not found in that people. So why did God love and save Israel? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, it explicitly says, The Lord did not set his love on you, Israel, or choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. In other words, God saving Israel was not because of anything great within Israel, but because of his love, because of his faithfulness, because he keeps his word. So the term glorify often means to magnify in a positive way. To really zoom in with a magnifying glass on what that thing is and expose it for how beautiful it is. Glorifying God is recognizing who He is as He's been revealed in the scriptures. So the more we get to understand who God is, we get blown away. And when we come to the uh, message of the gospel, uh, especially in Ephesians, the motivation of God in redemption is that we might be to the praise of His glory. So it's actually, it's the opposite of uh, the song that has that line, um, like a rose trampled on the ground. Like a rose trampled on the ground. And it says, and, and he, he thought of me above all. which of course makes perfect sense to a person. They say, well, of course, everybody would think about me. But in actual fact, no. His focus was on himself. His focus was on his glory. Yes, he loves humanity, but that's not the primary motivation. The primary motivation is his love for himself and a desire to show off himself. And he wants us to see not just the power and creativity we can see in nature. He wants us to see his grace and his mercy and he even wants us to see his wrath. For the sake of my name, I delay my wrath. And for my praise, I restrain it for you in order not to cut you off. And you might think, well, that's kind of egotistical. God is all about himself. Like, that's really annoying, you know. But who else could God be about? For God to not be God-centered would be actually to say something untrue about the universe. Because God truly is at the center of the universe. He's the creator of all things. We all are in the orbit around Him. But there is a beauty in the fact that God can be focused on Himself and His own glory uh, because God is a trinity. And so there is a paradoxical others-centeredness even there in the God-centeredness of God. And the Father, in an expression of love to the Son, determined that He would create a world that he would allow that world to fall into sin, that he would recover from that world a redeemed humanity, that he would give that redeemed humanity as a bride to his son so that that redeemed humanity forever and ever and ever could glorify his son. You are in some sense an incidental part of a great act of love that is within the Trinity. 
Everything is to the glory of God. God is righteous. He is the highest good, the most beautiful thing, the only perfect being. And therefore, He's the only thing in the universe that actually deserves praise and honor and glory. God would be unrighteous if He let us glorify anything else other than Him. Something underneath of sin was so important for heaven to pay such a high price to redeem your life. You see, if God saved me because of my value, then my focus is on myself and how amazing I am. Because God thought so highly of you that He sent His Son and thought that you were worth it. So In other words, I'm worshiping myself. But if God saved me because of His love, who He is, not who I am, then God's glory, His value, His worth is magnified. Heaven thought that much of you that God sent His only Son for you. If God started pointing at us, we'd be missing out on the greatest gift, which is Himself. And so for God to glorify Himself and point the world to Himself, He's actually doing the most loving thing possible because there is nothing else more satisfying than God. There is nothing more lovely than God. There is nothing more loving than God. The love of God is greatly and exponentially amplified when God loves those who are unlovely. Jesus didn't come into the world because you were such a grotesque sinner. Now the teaching of William Paul Young and Todd White, they're similar in that they both are denying the doctrine of original sin. I think the lie is that all we are is a piece of crap and it's just because God is Well, that's merciful a lie sometimes. some religions tell people, that yeah. you are born of sin, you are sin. You're, yes. you're depraved, you're yes. worthless. Yeah. yeah. Now, Scripture is clear on this. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, and all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. See, we've said that we're worthless and we're worms in the dirt, right. not realizing that that's what Satan is. Christ and his work doesn't find its value because of who I am as the one whom he redeemed. We're saying that my worth is not in what I own. My worth is not in my achievements. But I instead find my value in the fact that the one of ultimate worth died to redeem me in spite of the fact that I was inherently not worthy of that. The therapeutic gospel says, God loves me because I'm valuable. The biblical gospel says, I am valuable because God loves me. Anyone can love someone who's, who's lovely. Uh, there's nothing supernatural about that or nothing even divine about that. You see, we love things that are attractive to us, the things that are the most beautiful, the most expensive. But see, God is different than us. God loves sinners who are the opposite of attractive to Him. In fact, He dies for His enemies. That is amazing love, unparalleled love, matchless love that can only come from God. What was God doing at Calvary? There was a simultaneous display of all God's attributes not just his love and forgiveness, but by no means letting the guilty party go. Love and wrath on display, goodness and kindness on display, justice and mercy on display simultaneously.
Powerful. Morning, Lori. You're still muted, Lori, just so you know. She just went away. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my camera. Uh oh. That's the kind of camera I look best on, Lori. <laughs> Did I accidentally? Oh, I must have accidentally hey, shut it off. <laughs> hey, Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're all blurry. We're blurry. Now, if I talk, maybe it'll come to. I don't know why we're all blurry. That's interesting. And we are blurry. Maybe it focused on something and unfocused. <laughs> I do one of these things, maybe. No, don't do it. There we go. Yeah, I did the same thing. Okay. I don't know. Well, I look better when we're blurry. So, anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, so we we finished. Uh, a couple questions I had when I was going through this. First of all, what did you think of? Uh, Bart Campolo, uh, he has many friends that's still inside the church, uh, for, uh, ministers and missionaries that are still preaching and being missionaries that are still uh, still doing all that and they believe like he does, but they don't know what they'll do with their lives. Um, I thought of Judas, and I've heard teachings on Judas for ever <coughs> Uh, Palm Sunday and celebrating Resurrection Day. And I thought of Judas um, and I, I Christ's words, woe to him who betrays me, you know, it, it would have been better for him if he had never been born. What's going to be God's reaction to ministers who are leading people down the wrong path? The Bible says that uh I don't get exactly how important, but teachers will be held to a higher accountability. Right. That's correct. So, and I heard one pastor just yesterday say the hottest part of hell is going to be reserved for Judas. And all I can think of is that people that are leading believers uh, and non believers down the wrong path will be uh, held in utter contempt by God. I don't know. But justice of God's going to be more severe on them than on just a plain person who never heard the gospel um, or people that are, you know, I don't know, it, it, it was scary to me when I, when I heard him say that. Scary enough that he walked away from the faith, basically he did. But also, at least it, give him credit, like uh, the one person said, Bart, or the other guy, uh, Former atheist who became a Christian, his wife is ill. Um, he said, uh, he, and I agree, he's glad that they walked away and they're being honest at least. That way they're not leading people astray. That's so that came to me. Um, and again, we cannot reject penal substitution meaning death, burial, and resurrection of Christ paying for our sins, and be a Christian. We can't say no to that. We have to say, we have to agree with it, and that God, Jesus did all this. Um, another, th another phrase that I heard in there, uh, Bart Campolo said, as he said, as he walked away from the faith, he said, the God that he invented, he really liked that guy. Um, and all I can think of was, Israel, idolatry, um, idolatry in the world today, worshiping the creature, worshiping things, um, money, um, emotion, sex, whatever it might be that we, that people, not we, but that people put on the pedestal of their, their, the God that they worship. Um, the reason they do that, several reasons, but one of them is, like Bart says, I really like that guy. That, I, that he created. You like the God because, of course, if you create God yourself, you can satisfy him. You're going to create a God that you can do something for that 
will pay you back. And everything that we receive from God, God is good to us. God blesses us. Um, God loves us. But it's not because of anything we've done. It's grace. And I mentioned grace many times as I need to. Uh, and grace is unmerited favor. I became a Christian in 1983 because God gave me a revelation of grace was. I figured out there wasn't anything I could do to appease God. He had done it all. It was the grace of God that allows me to be saved. And his grace saved me for eternity. That's good news. I guess that's why they call it the gospel, right? Good news. Um, when you, and, and the comparison here in the movie was, was called then, I think, liberal, liberal or progressive Christianity really is a form of atheism. You're denying, you're not take, giving glory to God, you're giving glory to yourself. Paul White kept continually said, uh, uh, you were so worth it that God died for you. Well, no, God died for you because he loves you. He loves you as an act of his will, not because of anything we've done. Um, and you can work 24 hours a day in the church. You can uh, do all these, you know, give away all your money. But Paul said, you do all this and don't have love. It's worthless. Um, so, again, liberal Christianity is on the road to atheism, and you listen to what's going on in the world today, and unfortunately what's going on in our nation, we're heading right down that path. The, the farther we go down that path, the worse it's going to get, and it's getting pretty bad now, but to the point where we will deny God as a nation, it's coming. Um, I don't want it to come. So, how would you all define faith? They tried to define it in the movie. I thought they did a pretty good job, but how would you all define faith? What's your definition of faith? Uh, believing in somehow in yourself, knowing what's as yet unseen. I mean, we really, when we think about you know, people are like not having faith. You have faith in your doctor. You have faith in your car. You have, you have, car you have faith you in people who build key. buildings and bridges. You go on them. I mean, it is a completely different thing than biblical faith. But at the same time, people are like, "Well, I, I, I can't live by faith. I have to see it." Well, if you've ever walked up a set of stairs, you've had faith that something is behind it. I mean, it's on a, a whole different level, but I mean, just as, as far as faith, you're believing. Yeah, and it's. Uh, other than that, thing, I think it's the same way. You have to believe. Speak up a little. You have to believe, believe, okay, and trust God. No matter, you can't see, but you just trust, knowing. Just like when I get in that car every day. I trust that I can do this because I know because my father in heaven told me that I can do it. Okay. So that's what whatever I can't see him, but I know that he is with me. And he's my constant companion all the time. Right. And no matter what the situations that are that are happening in my life, I have to trust him. Trust. Yeah. He's gonna see whatever it is, he's gonna get me through it, whether it's what it it's good, it's good and bad experiences, and we have to trust God. Then he knows what's best for us. Yep. Okay. Trust. That's a great definition. Anybody else? Mike, what about you? Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. Is that the, is that the right one? Yeah. I can remember Bible verses. I can't remember chapter and verse, though, which is <laughs> not a good thing. But God gives me the scriptures to use. You know, one thing, too, when you talk about faith, people kind of mock you. I remember 
I think I should have before years ago. I was listening to WPC or something. I don't even remember the past or what. They got to talk about you know Big Bang evolution, the things that people, the theories that people, well, they accept them as fact, but the theories. And if you really look at like the theory of evolution and how things are and just in general, so this day I remember he made the statement, I don't have the faith it takes to be an atheist. And that's if you really think about it, being an atheist does take a lot of faith in them. How do you explain? You know, they're like, well, people are basically good people. Well, then how do you have the faith to say somebody that's a murderer? If there's one single murderer in the world, how do you have faith that people as a whole can take care of ourselves, can be good? It's um, sometimes I think atheists have more faith than Christians do just in the wrong thing. There was a, a scholar back in the 19th century who came up with a perfect machine. This, the, the, he defined a perfect machine, and the perfect machine would be something that could uh, uh, feed itself, reproduce itself, and uh, uh, handle everything that was going on in its general area. And uh, he said, it's, there's no way that we can invent something like that. Uh, but they, what he defi was defining was a human cell. And he got all done with it. Human cell that we have billions of in our trillions of in our body um, and that's a miracle and you know uh, believing in atheism is like uh, and that there's no creator is like throwing a bunch of parts in a bag shaking them up and expecting a watch to come out you know well, you can like, shake um, it for a million years it's not going to come out it was a really good movie that uh bill and mary brought out to duck of uh fearfully and wonderfully made i think it was called or wonderfully made wonderfully made wonderfully made and it talked about like they talked about just like the eyeball and the amazing thing about it. It's, it was it was a set of like five different things. It was called wonderfully made. It was really interesting. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and, and his uh, his hand is in all of it. He's eating those things, trying to play God, trying to make babies, and trying to do all this stuff. You can't do what God can do. Well, the old joke is uh, this guy was. Railing at God, he said. Uh, um, he says, "You know, I can, I can create a plant. I can do anything you can do. I can create a plant." He says, uh, "Okay." God says, "Go ahead, prove it." He says, "Okay, let me have some dirt." He says, "No, make you got to make the dirt first. <laughs> you know." Uh, and I, it's true. Well, let's go. Let me go in a different direction. Um, Mike and Lori and uh, I, I, I listened, used to listen to Robbie Zacharias. Uh, I heard her refer to that in there. She made it 2018 before the desiccated human waste material hit the rapidly rotating blade in this ministry. Did you hear that they're going to close it down, basically? They're closing down the entire Robbie Zacharias ministry um, over what he, what he did. Um, he is a Christian. She talked about him in the movie. Robbie Zacharias was a Christian apologist. Um, he was a very cerebral uh, arguer for the faith and, and really put a lot of thought into it. But his life, we now know, was a sham. Um, he was doing some very bad things. And I thought of Jim Baker back in the day. And I thought of some of the other Christian, the pastors and over the years that have fallen. Um, and I, I see that happening. And, you know, we are human. We are all capable of doing anything at any time. We will sin. Um, when, unfortunately, when a Christian leader sins, it <coughs> can really sh shake the bedrock of faith in some people. But the reason I even mention it is because uh, Robbie had some very good ideas. And he was, when I heard Robbie say, the teachings that I heard were right on. And they were well thought. But we have to, as Christians, we have to be not looking at Scott or Bill or Joe or Mike. We have to look up. We have to look up at God 
and he is the author of Finish Your Bar Faith. It's not me or anyone else. It's him. And if I screw up, that's a reflection on me. That's not a reflection of God. Unfortunately, if you are a teacher, you're held to a higher you're held to a higher standard, and people look up to you. And if you fall, unfortunately, you could take people with you. And I guess maybe God does that to make people look up and realize that it's not me doing the teaching. It's the Holy Spirit in me that is teaching. You're going to say, John, I'm sorry. But uh, to to shut down his ministry, it just seems like you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, why get rid of the good teachings just because he, like everybody else, is human and had failings in life, if anything? It should show, like, here's a man who had weaknesses, like anybody else. I'm not familiar with what he did, but like anybody else who's sitting in his I mean, nobody's without sin, we know that. Just like anybody else who's sitting in his life, but God still managed to use him in a mighty way and reach a lot of people. I, it just seems to me that if you're going to shut down a, a ministry because of the failings of the pastor, then there's where you can find any ministry. Nobody is without sin. It's, I just hate to see him throw away all the wonderful teachings that he has. I've, I've listened to him a number of times too. I hate to see him throw that away because of his failings when we all have. He has a, and to, just to, uh, to focus on that for a moment, what's happened is the board, the board of directors, if you will, of uh, Rowdy Zacharias International came to the decision that because of everything that has come out, and they, as a ministry, they see themselves as being um, not yeah, holding him accountable and knowing what was going on, I guess I would say. There was rumblings of problems, I guess, last year before he died. He died last May. A year ago, May, he died. I guess there was, uh, people were coming out to some extent before all this, before he passed away. And they kind of basically, oh, they stood behind them, and everybody stood behind them saying, oh, you know, it's rumors and innuendo. And then they found out they, the ministry did the right thing. They hired an investigative team, <clears throat> uh, external, uh, paid money to do a full investigation on what, uh, on the allegations, and found out they were true. So that's why they're, they're doing, whether they're doing the right thing or not, they have to answer to God. Joe, so I, I, I know what you're saying. I'm going to go on, uh, see if I can get to the podcast and download them. Because, like I said, I mean, he, he did what he did, but he also gave some great teachings. Yeah. Yeah. He was without sin, Kansas. Exactly. That's right. I agree. Uh, I think, I think, think it may also have to do with the fact that um, his, decept- his deceptive behavior. Uh, is going to grossly impact the income that the ministry had. Um, his behavior was financed by the money that was brought in through the ministry. I mean, that's how he got paid. And it financed behavior that was not pleasing to God. So I would imagine in the future that those donations would be significantly um decreased and i don't know that the the ministry uh it's probably better that the people uh that worked at that ministry and were uh, our true believers continue to proclaim the gospel um you know it's just it may be in a different name right um but the ministry probably should not be uh Robbie continuing to, to use his name. Um, but yeah, I, I would imagine the donations would be significantly, would not be able to support the ministry. Initially, um, when they when this first happened and everything came out and they they had the due diligence, they did the investigation. Um, um, they were gonna keep the ministry and change the name and take his name completely out of it. And then I guess, to your point, Laurie, maybe they saw that 
you know, they were getting an X number of dollars before, and now they're getting like a tenth of that, that they would just, you know, turn it off, I guess. That's a guess. Uh, this, is a, this is a real difficult topic because we, we, uh, we're talking about our culture and about uh, sin in the Bible. And, you know, typically when the Bible is talking about um, us uh, continuing to sin or sending, you know, sinning after uh, supposedly being saved, the Bible is referring to somebody that's actively working against the gospel and not not uh, cultural problems. So like what, uh, what Joe was saying, you know, you're throwing out a good ministry because of the actions of a person and his behavior uh, adhorent to our culture would have been acceptable in others. So <clears throat> we have to be careful not to um, confuse the two. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Bar Campolo there he came out as a secular humanist. So the, the kind of sin that uh, I think a lot of times scripture is referring to is a Bart Campolo who stays in the ministry, doesn't, doesn't actively come out and say, I'm a secular humanist. He stays in the ministry and actively works against the gospel mm -hmm. from within the church. Right. And, and I think that's the kind of um, sinfulness that a lot of times scripture is referring to. Was that, did that make sense or am I? Like, uh, my, um, the only caveat I would have is um, looking back at as, as the gospel was going out, people that were in positions of authority that sinned, um, I think of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, God does, God deals with sin <laughs> even in the church in a, a definite way. I mean, we are all uh, sinners saved by grace. We are given the ability to repent. But if we are sinning in a way that is, let's look at it another way. Let's say <laughs> someone who was a, uh, in the ministry, was a, uh, an adulterer or let, let's, homosexual or uh, was was stealing, literally stealing money. Um, just like if I, for, for Will, whatever, just got caught with that, him, his wife, and the husband and the wife had some man coming in the bedroom. They got a big ministry, and they had that going on and all that stuff as well. But I mean, I think a lot of this, I mean, this been going on forever. It's always going on, but now with the media, it is certain things is happening, just like in Hollywood, all this the sex and, and everything itself. But to me, it is a lot. But that's why the young people are having a hard time too, because when you got ministers and all these people that's in power, they doing all these ungodly things, and then they be like, why would they want to come to church? Why? Right. You know, so right. that's why if you got to be examples and people got to be really forgiving, like you said, with that, that other guy, you know, you're supposed to turn away from sin, you know, you ain't supposed to keep doing it, but you're going to church preaching the gospel and talking about um, homosexuality when you up here watching a man scoring your wife. So, you know, double standards. Well, that's why they say to save the wretch like me. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, you know what I originally heard was someone saying that, that I really like, and it applied to, it just it really reminded me of the one day with uh, with the night owl, the teenagers came <coughs> out, and people were talking about how difficult their life was, some of them and felt they didn't want to go on at one point. Mm -hmm. but the old saying is broken people helping broken people. Yeah. Again, you don't you don't condone what he did, but I mean, if you put anybody under the microscope, they're gonna grow. They're gonna you're gonna find you yeah. put anyone's life under a microscope, you're gonna find yeah. fault because guess what? We are human. We do even when we're saved, we still have that nature in us. You know, right Romans uh the Romans seven where Paul talks about oh wretched man that I yeah. am, uh who can save me from this? 
and, and oh, thank God he, he will, he did, Jesus Christ. You know, again, by, or by the grace of God, I go I. I think we need to look, bringing this full circle. When we see someone fallen, I think rather than forming a firing squad, we need to put our arm around them and try to bring them back to repentance. And yeah, the only... The only good example, like Katrina saying, and we are held, you are held up as an example, but the fact is the only good example is Christ. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, and the, the, there's the problem. The other examples are all human. And uh, if you start scraping under the surface, you're going to find fault. And well, there's true. just, uh, so you're right, Scott. The big problem with unbelievers seeing that is that hypocrisy. A lot of these unbelievers are like, look, look, he was sexy. If you actually yeah. took a study, you'd probably find out that 97% of them believe in prostitution and uh, pornography. Well, you know, again, we are held to a different now, but you know, we, we are held to a higher standard. I heard uh, anyone familiar with Dr. James Boyce? Dr. Boyce died 21 years, 20 years ago, 21 years ago now. How many of you remember? <laughs> Your nose just got six inches longer. Anyway, uh, he just said uh, people would come to him and say, you know, I, I I joined the church, but there's a bunch of hypocrites in there. He says, well, yeah, that, that means, and then, you know what, you probably shouldn't join either because you're a hypocrite. You know? <laughs> um, church is not perfect. Uh, we are not perfect. We'll be perfected once we're translated and then after we're, we're passed away. But we are not perfect. Uh, well, when they say the church is full of hypocrites, technically the proper response is that's okay. We got to do. I wouldn't say that to somebody who's not a believer yet. But. Well, McGee always put it. McGee always put it well, and you know, you look at it from a human standpoint. He said, "People say, well, I, I'm looking for the perfect church." He says, "Well, don't join it because when you join it, it won't be perfect anymore." So. <laughs> He actually, uh, one of the things he was doing recently, I was listening to one of his daily things, and it's very interesting. He says, if you knew me like I knew me, you wouldn't listen to me. He said, but don't touch that towel, because if I knew you like you know you, I wouldn't talk to you. <laughs> yeah. And yes. I think that really summed up quite well. It's true. It does. It does. He's finishing up Revelation. Another week and a half, he'll be done with Revelation, two weeks. And uh, then he goes on to start in Genesis. We're starting Jeremiah next week. So I, I'm kind of excited about that. I, I, you know, last few minutes here, I'd like to know, what did you think of this? Was it worth our time to do this? Absolutely. Um, did you, did it, did it help you, does it help you see unbelievers in a different light, see what they're thinking? Did it help you give some talking points that maybe in love we can now speak to what they're saying. Did, that, did it help doing that at all? Yeah, you know, one thing is a little off topic. I may have misunderstood the timeline, but that Ann Polo mentioned the bad bicycle accident. I, I can't help wondering. Maybe she should undergo a very, very thorough physical and such. Because they've had a lot of times where people like have changed a brain injury or something and changed their behavior. Can they, to be honest with you, when I first saw that, I thought the same thing, Joe. Yeah. I thought maybe this has something to do with where he's gone. And is God a big enough God to know that? Yes. So we have to, again, the sovereignty of God. Has, if they, this is spoken to me about anything, it's God is sovereign. He really is. He is in control of everything. He knows everybody's entire world. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Thoughts the only thing I would say about this series, Scott, is that earlier on, or maybe it was the first uh, movie, it 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 would be confusing to a a, a new Christian or a non Christian to because they jump back and forth so quick between say, uh, you know, they'd flash a picture of Joel Osteen and then go to uh, uh, Alistair Begg, and I could see it confusing. Um, <clears throat> folks if they didn't have some knowledge of what was being discussed beforehand you know what i'm saying i do absolutely and when i first i watched it i watched the first hour uh, a little over an hour by myself without looking at the book i gave you all 
and, and the first couple pages explaining who the deconstructions were and who uh, Bar Campolo was and so on. Um, I thought it was, <coughs> I had to read that first and then it made sense to me what they were doing. The second, that was the second movie, Mike, was, to me was really confusing. Unless you had. Yeah, they, I, yeah. I mean, I got it, but I could see where it might might confuse folks if they didn't have, you know, some knowledge of what was being discussed. <clears throat> so. I think this is more of a, what we just what watched has been more meat and milk to a new Christian. It might be really confusing to someone who has had some, and I'm talking about a super Christian, you know, I'm just talking about someone who's had some study in the word, has had some time it made more sense. Uh, I say, you might look at some of them and think, hey, I like what he's saying. Well, this is it. That's you know, exactly you right. You can have a new home. You can have a Ferrari. You can have, uh, what is it the same? Preaching to people with itchy ears. You can tell them what they want to hear. They will heap to themselves teachers. They will be have itching ears. Heaping to themselves teachers that basically are saying what they want to hear. You know? I mean, yeah. I like the idea of owning a Ferrari, but fortunately, Knowledge enough in the world, and they're going to go take out the loan. <laughs> yeah, but well, some people would see that and think, "Well, yeah, I like this." That's consistent with, you know, what I can't remember who, who said it, but it was like asking his friends, "So, what are you going to do now?" I mean, I'm. They basically saying, "Well, I'm too old to change," and I was thinking that while they're thinking that if they really believe the gospel and start preaching the gospel, their fear is everybody's going to leave. And they're not going to have a job anymore. And there is that, that, what I'm preaching is keeping people here. Right. It's and what they want. And they're sending in money. Yeah. And there is there is that. I think, you know, say what you want about Knox Church. Our pastor preaches the word of God on a consistent basis. Um, I, I'm not lifting him up on a pedestal. I'm saying, though, that here at Knox, we do teach the word of God. We don't teach a prosperity gospel. We don't teach the gospel of feel good today and, you know, God's going to give you everything you want. Um, we look at the word of God as the inerrant word of God. We don't look at it as a guide. It is the word of God. We use the word of God to live our lives by. And I think and we may not be a large church and You've heard allusions or people speaking about this in the series that, you know, you might have a church down the street that's telling you what they want to hear and might have 10,000 people attending. And then you have a small church like Knox that is teaching the word of God that might have an, an in-person attendance of about 50 people on average and a, an electronic uh, congregation of about 20 every week. Um, and but we are teaching the word of God, and uh, people can come here and learn the truth. The problem is not everybody wants to know the truth. What's that song? Lie to me, tell me you love me, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, tell me lies, tell me super lies. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was complete with that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, get, I guess the only um, uh. I don't know what the word is. Um, I only thought about the, the videos, which I thought were really good, was that if a new believer saw those, they would think being a believer is so complicated that they don't have a critical enough mind to become one. And that's obviously not the case, but I could see where a, a new believer would be overwhelmed by, by that much information. Second movie, absolutely. What's that? The second movie, absolutely. The mm -hmm. second movie should not be watched um, alone without being able to discuss it with other other believers. Right. Yes. Well, it, it and I think the people who did these movies did that on purpose. They did. Uh, they created the first one as a broad brush stroke. And then they came back to the second one to read, to, to maybe sharpen the image in on the essential. 
an essential thing is Christ crucified. That's what it called it. Because without the crucifixion, we uh, without the resurrection, we are all men to be most pity. You know, <coughs> here we are giving our lives, if you will, to the gospel and leading our lives by the guy. If Jesus really didn't rise from the dead, then you know this is all futile. This is all not worth it. But he did. He did. Do people need to realize when they talk to someone who's a Christian when they talk to someone who's not a believer and says, well, I don't know about this and this and this. They need to know. It's like, look, I had the same questions you did at one point. I still have certain questions that I don't understand. Yeah, that, that's like if, when you go to college, you, you're not expected to be a physics professor after your first semester. They, they need to be like milk and meat. They need to be reminded, look, there's nothing wrong with having these questions. It's getting the right answers. And it's not where you can go for the right answers. It's where it's yeah. it who's teaching and yeah. who you learn it from it helps. You know, that important thing. And, and I think maybe this can help our discernment meter, if you will. Um, again, my whole point when I saw this was we're hearing all this stuff these secular humanists are saying. It's out there every day. The actual what to say and to really maybe hope help us solidify in our minds what we believe is why this is so good in my opinion helped us focus in on the important things like christ crucified that it's not just uh, uh god is part this and part that he's all of it all together that jesus is 100 percent god and 100 percent man it wasn't well he was 50 and 50 50 50 he was fully man and fully god and as being fully man, he could uh, die on the cross for our sins because he lived the perfect life that we couldn't. It's 7 o'clock. Um, I see Mike. We've already lost Mike. I'm sorry, Mike. You're probably doing, doing something in the background. but um, Yeah, our, sm our house is small enough you can hear it from anywhere. <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, let's say, we'll close with a word of prayer. Um, I'll get stuff out to you like working on Jeremiah. Um, we'll get started with Jer the book of Jeremiah next week, which uh, I can't tell you how many times in the last week I've heard Isaiah and Jeremiah quoted in scripture by different teachers. And again, books of prophecy, they're there. Um, the Old Testament came before the New Testament. We, we, we're getting New Testament from the pulpit. We're getting New Testament on Sunday mornings, thanks to Mike. Um, it's important we look back so we can look ahead. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Who'd like to lead us out in prayer today? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you. Thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you. I'm thankful for our family, the church family. And as we leave here, Lord, I had your protection over each one of us. And for the ones that are not here for it, and I'm thank, thankful for this lessons that we learned from Scott. And um, I say thank you, and I love you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a good week. We'll see you all Sunday, Lord, Lord willing. Yeah. Amen.